Hello, welcome to the breakout session living next to a wind, wind tower. Come on in and uh, there's a sign up sheet at the back if you need professional development hours you can sign in there and you can get those PDHs taken care of. Um, I'm Jeff McPeak with Olson Associates. Olson Associates is an engineering and environmental consulting firm with offices throughout the central U.S. Been working on projects throughout that same footprint. I personally am involved in environmental studies and permitting for projects. I'm pleased to introduce to you today Mr. Peter Goulderg. Uh, Peter has 40 years of experience as an acoustics and environmental consultant. He has a BS in mathematics from MIT, an MS in atmospheric science from the University of Michigan, and is a full member of the Institute of Noise Control Engineering. He provides consulting services to both wind farm developers and state and local agencies that review and permit wind energy projects. Mr. Goulberg has successfully completed sound and shadow flicker studies for 85 wind projects in 15 states from Oklahoma to Maine. Uh, Peter's got a very applicable topic for us here today, and, and I'll turn it over to Peter. Thank you. Jeff. I'm going to speak for about 40 minutes to allow plenty of time for questions. Um, I'm going to try and accomplish two things today. That is to provide you some facts about uh, the c conflicts that one encounters in doing wind turbine siding, and to describe a balanced approach of how one develops a viable wind project while still being a good neighbor. Regarding the siding process, uh, we'll examine the issues of sound, channel flicker, visual impact, complaints. Do those represent health impacts or just uh, annoyance? And conclude with some recommendations. There are many constraints to developing a wind farm. And while the list of uh, issues may seem daunting, there's been significant progress in turbine siding in recent years. GIS software and the accurate uh, computer models allow projects to be sensitive to community concerns while still locating sufficient number of turbines on each section of land to ensure a viable <coughs> project. So using those types of tools, in our business we produce what's called a total constraints map, such as the one I show here. This is for a 40 turbine project in the Midwest. And the colored contours uh, around the outside are the sound uh, decibel level contours. You'll see yellow and green butterflies centered on each turbine that describe the, the shadow flicker um, results. The orange lines are interference cones for microwave and television. The residences are black dots, and if you, if you can kind of strain your eyes a bit, you'll see that there are some very small areas left, like this. The purple enclosures, that's where you can build a wind farm, <laughs> after all those constraints. So, so a total constraints map helps, helps the developer at the outset to see you know, what area does he have, if any, um, that, that's available to put in turbines, and where can he put those turbines, given the turbine to turbine spacing that the manufacturer <coughs> requires uh, that you uh, use. On to our first subject, which is a sound. And let's just define terms on each of these subjects as we begin. Sound pressure levels are, are how we measure it. They are expressed as A-weighted uh, decibels. The A-weighting approximates how the human ear responds to sound pressure. Uh, the decibel scale is to accommodate uh, the, the full range of, of uh, pressures that we hear, and we have numbers between 0 and 120 that represent what the human ear hears. So what are some typical sound levels? I always like to start with 65 decibels, which is what uh, the conversation is between two people. If someone was, Jeff was sitting right here three feet from me, and we were just having a normal conversation without this microphone, he would be hearing 65 decibels of my voice, and I would be hearing the same with his voice. And I brought with me today a, a sound meter to, to show you what the sound levels are in this room. I'll just pass it around. Uh, ask that somebody bring it back up at, at, at the end. Uh, before all of you came into the room, uh, Jeff and I just, just sat here and we, uh, we stopped talking and that the quietest it got in this room with nobody in here was 45 decibels. And then before he did his introductions and everybody was kind of tittering out there, it was around 50 decibels out there. Now you can see 
with my, my speaking, we're probably up in, into the 60 to 65 decibel range. Just to give you an idea about what each of these decibel levels are. So I, I have this graph here that, that shows you a nice rule of thumb about acoustics is that uh, every 10 decibel change as you go up the scale represents a doubling of loudness. So let's start with 45 decibels, which outdoors is typically a quiet suburban area. <coughs> And maybe in, in the summer, you'll he have a night where you'll have what you think are loud crickets or tree fogs. That's maybe 55. 65, we already talked about. That's a normal conversation between just two people. So each of these are twice as loud. So 45 to 55 is twice as loud. 65 is twice as loud. Stand near a car going by in the road, that's 75 decibels. That's twice as loud. So you can go up and down the scale. Every 10 decibel change represents either a doubling or having of loudness. Now in public hearings, I often hear a comment from, from somebody who says, well, I live in a very quiet area. You know, I'm not sure I want these wind turbines. I know it's 25 or 30 decibels in my area at night. And what the person saying that forgets is that the night when they might measure 25 or 30 decibels, which is really very, very quiet, uh, would be a night when there's no wind. And on a night like that, wind turbines don't operate. So you always have to remember when we're talking about what the existing condition is, is what is the existing condition on a windy night when the turbines would operate. And on those nights, when the, a turbine would be at full power, there's a lot of natural wind noise. Noise from just wind turbulence, from wind blowing through trees, crops, around farm buildings and terrain, all of that can be substantial. In doing an acoustic study for a wind turbine project, we typically take measurements before and after to uh, document what, what the existing sound levels are without the <coughs> turbines in the first case. And we use what's called the equivalent or LEQ sound level because EPA says that best correlates with how people perceive and react to sound. This is an example of measurements made at a wind turbine site in the Midwest before the turbines were constructed. And we have down here the hub height wind speed on the uh, x-axis, and we've got uh, sound levels 25, 35, 45 up here on the y-axis. And you'll notice this line that slopes up. This is typical. You, you can go to, to any agricultural area uh, and collect a, a, a mass of data, and you will find that as the wind speed increases, the background sound level increases also. That's because you're measuring wind noise. So let's take that line from the previous uh, graph, and that is now the blue line on this somewhat idealized graph. We still have wind speed down here on the X and sound level on the Y axis, and I've added in this dashed yellow line. The dashed yellow line is the sound that's <coughs> produced by a wind turbine. It's been cited such that it produces a maximum of 45 decibels. So you'll see at four meters per second, which is the cut in wind speed for the turbine, is when it first appears on the scene. And it too increases the sound it generates as wind speed increases, just like the natural background. But around 10 meters per second, it reaches its maximum acoustic power and then it flattens out. And this is true of, of all industrial wind uh, machines because then the yaw and the pitch controls take over and the sound power does not increase. The green line is the sum of the blues and the yellows. So the green line you'll see also increases, but in, in a slightly different manner with wind speed. And I illustrate this because the green line is what you can measure in the environment. You can't measure wind turbine sound directly. And this is, this is the challenge in doing compliance testing at a wind farm. You can only measure the green line and then through different types of methods and ANSI standards, we have to calculate and deduce what the yellow line is to show compliance <coughs> with a sound limit. Let's look at another aspect of wind turbine sound, and that is how it varies with distance. So I've given you here a graph that's got some, some different uh, numbers on it. <coughs> Along the x-axis here we have the distance from the base of a wind turbine, so this is in meters, but we have sound level here on the a y axis as before. And this is the sound from a single 1.8 megawatt Vestas V100 wind turbine. 
So if we start at uh, 100 meters, which is what we call the far field in acoustics, and we look at how the sound varies as you walk farther and farther from the turbine, you'll see that the sound level decreases about six decibels for every double lean of distance. So that's another acoustic rule. Six decibel decrease for every double lean of distance. So we go from 100 to 200 meters, this line drops six decibels. But to get the next six decibel drop, we've got to go to 400 meters. And then we have to go to 800 meters to, to get yet another uh, drop of six decibels. So what does this graph tell us in terms of what the effect of, of, of wind turbine regulations might be. If we go out to 300 meters here, which is about 1,000 feet, you'll see this single wind turbine of about the size you would find in a, in a wind farm produces 45 A-weighted decibels. If we go out to 700 meters, that's way over on the far end of that graph, that's about close to a half mile, you'll see that, that wind turbine, single wind turbine, produces 37 decibels. But these are expected sound levels from a wind turbine. It's what we call its nominal sound power level. But when a consultant uh, such as Jeff or, or myself does an analysis for, a, for a, a client, we have to add in an uncertainty factor because the sound power is, is not just a single fixed number. So if you add in another two decibels of what we call an uncertainty factor into this analysis, then to reach a sound level as low as 37 decibels here, you would need to have a distance of at least 3,000 feet to the nearest uh, residence from any single wind turbine. Now I've highlighted 37 decibels because uh, the Lancaster County uh, Board is considering a proposal to lower the, the sound limit for new wind projects in that county uh, to 37 decibels at, at night. And what would be the effect of that? It would require a minimum setback of at least 3,000 feet from any single turbine. Of course, we know that wind projects are not economically viable as single turbines, so if you had a pair of turbines, for example, two turbines together, if you just wanted to build two turbines, they would each have to be uh, one mile back from the nearest residence. If you consider what, what is the size of a section of land in a rural area, uh, it's one mile by one mile, okay? And where are the houses? The houses are on the rural roads that are along the boundaries of the section. So if you try to put one turbine in the middle of a section of land, what's the distance to, to, to any of the boundaries where the houses are? 20, half a mile, 2,600 feet. So just by that simple exercise, you, you, you can understand that a sound limit of 37 decibels that the Lancaster Board is proposing is a ban on wind development in Lancaster County. You can't permit a single, a single turbine because there isn't going to be a section of land that doesn't have a house somewhere a half a mile away or even a mile away. Another thing that is often mentioned in uh, regulatory hearings is that, oh, let's set a setback distance, a single setback distance, to deal with the sound issue. And my recommendation is no, don't use setback distances for regulating sound. You want to regulate sound, say what it should be, 45 or 50. Because when you set a setback distance, you're ignoring the fact that there's no simple relationship between distance and the sound impact because we're not talking about one wind turbine in a project, we're talking many turbines and they have varying distances to each house. It, that also deprives a project of the flexibility that they need to sometimes plan in a turbine or two in a certain corner of the layout with what we call noise reduced operation. It's not uh, feasible economically to design a whole project under NRO, but often it makes sense to put in one or two more turbines uh, with, with some NRO. So don't go the route of setback distances. So when designing a uh, wind farm, what limit should be used? I always say, well, of course, a locally determined standard because uh, everybody has a different idea of what is an acceptable sound level. For example, one of the first projects I worked on was <coughs> 
at the holy name uh, Central Catholic High School in Worcester, Massachusetts. This goes back a number of years. And they have a Vestas uh, turbine that's located equally <laughs> equidistant between the classrooms and, and athletic fields, 200 feet from, from each. And uh, the students view this wind turbine very favorably. It's integrated into the campus. It doesn't interfere with athletics or the classrooms or anything. Um, I took a colleague out there uh, soon after it started operation and it was on a windy day and we parked right underneath the turbine and got out of the car and the sound level there was about 55 decibels. That's what it, you'll typically hear if you stand right underneath a, a, uh, a wind turbine of this size. And he got out of the car and he said, is this it? <laughs> Referring to the sound level, he says, is this what everybody's complaining about? <laughs> I said, yes. He says, that swish swish is, is quieter than the conversation I'm having with you. I said, yes, that's the point. <laughs> it's only 55 decibels. And we're not talking about locating wind turbines 200 feet from anybody's house in, in Nebraska. So while you know, a turbine this close to where, where people are actively doing things during the day is not what you would ideally want for a residential area where people are sleeping and you expect uh, a quieter background at night. It just illustrates that, that local standards are important. So here uh, is just a smattering of nighttime communi community sound limits across the country. Um, the state of Texas, none. Uh, the state of Maryland, 55. Uh, West Lafayette, Indiana, that's a college town, 55. Uh, Minnesota, 50. A uh, town in New York and Michigan, 50. Another county in Michigan, 45. And the state of Maine is, is uh, one of the lowest uh, in, in the nation at 42 decibels. So what if there is no regulatory limit? That we often encounter this, we'll go into an area, there is no wind zoning ordinance, there hasn't been a sound limit set. In those instances, I recommend to the client that he design to a, a goal of 45 decibels. And why is that? Well, first, both the EPA and the World Health Organization have published nighttime residential uh, noise guidelines that state you should aim to keep sound levels outside of a bedroom window where the window's cracked open for air to no more than 45 decibels. Uh, secondly, from my own experience uh, in this field, I know that that level minimizes the chance of complaints while allowing some wind farm development. 45 is still a more restricted level than many uh, wind projects have faced in the past. And it appears that the projects that we have all read about on the internet or in the newspapers that have multiple complaints usually were permitted with sound levels in the 50 to 55 decibel range. So th there is something to be said for using a slightly lower sound level limit when you're designing a wind farm, that is if you don't want to be hearing complaints for the next 25 years. Um, also, it's been my experience that wind farms that achieve 45 decibels with today's design of pitch controlled uh, wind turbines uh, also keep their low frequency sound below the American National Standard uh, S12.9 uh, limit that has been set to prevent uh, annoyance from infrasound and from low frequency sound. So it's kind of a, a paired benefit that if you design to 45, you probably will stay below that ANSI standard and you're, you're unlikely to have any uh, complaints associated with low frequency sound as well. Well, as a developer, uh, what options do you have? Or as a consultant, uh, what options do you have when you're trying to design a, a wind farm and, and you're faced with a rather stringent sound limit? Obviously, revising the layout, um, looking for, if you have to, a lower sound power turbine, verifying it's pitch regulated, not stall regulated, applying a range of noise reduced operation NRO to nighttime operation of certain turbines. But the one issue I haven't talked about yet is the one that everyone uh, wants to talk about, and that is uh, what about low frequency in infrasound? <laughs> So let's talk about some terms first. What is low frequency? Low frequency sound is generally that at 200 hertz or below. So what is 200 hertz or 200 cycles per second? If you've got a piano at home, hit middle C, that's 200. 
Okay. So everything below middle C is low frequency. Kind of makes sense. So what is that last key way down on, on the far left, that one you hit and it goes boom, 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 boom? That's about 28 hertz. So 28 hertz is close to the, the bottom of, of our normal hearing range. <coughs> and in fact, 20 hertz is where infrasound uh, starts by definition. <coughs> Infra simply means below in Latin, and so it means it's below the hearing threshold. So infrasound is nothing sinister, as some people in the anti-wind community would have you believe. There's nothing magical about it that's going to homogenize your insides. Infrasound is just normal sound that has a frequency below 20 hertz. So those are the definitions of low frequency and infrasound. Well, what about the sound? Uh, isn't it something unique that only wind turbines produce? Well, no, it is. Low frequency and infrasound are always present outdoors, everywhere uh, in the United States, from natural air turbulence, uh, distant thunderstorms, they don't have to be nearby, distant traffic noise, aircraft overhead, even miles away, um, and waves at the shoreline, that is, if, if you live, live near a great lake or, or the ocean. And just to show you some facts about infrasound, I'm, I'm going to come back to those in just a second. I'm going to put up this graph first. <clears throat> and this, this graph uh, shows you the spectrum of sound. So now you need to change your thinking about what, what's on the graph here. We have frequency along the x-axis, and here we have an unweighted decibel level. So low frequency sound, sound starts here at 200. Here's the middle C in the piano, and here's that last note on the piano over here. And 20 and below, this little slice down here is what is called infrasound. And the dashed orange line, it represents the hearing threshold of the human ear. Um, as set forth in ISO 226. You'll see that we don't hear very low frequency sound very well unless it's very loud. And in fact, at 16 hertz, which is usually what is used as the benchmark for what is infrasound, notice that the hearing threshold is 90 decibels. Now the other lines on this graph the solid ones show you the spectrum of natural background wind noise in an agricultural area at night. This is the site of a wind farm. That's, these measurements are taken at wind farm A, I'll call them. And they show that the infrasound on a windy night, this is a windy night when there's 10 meters per second at the hub height. So if the wind turbine was there, it would be generating full power. But the natural background sound is 60 to 65 decibels infrasound. Notice that it's well below the hearing threshold. You don't hear that. And so, really, we don't hear much of the low frequency sound natural below about 40 hertz here. The green line with the blue dots is a wind turbine. It's a, it's a typical wind turbine you would find in any wind farm that's being planned today. And it is sited such that the maximum sound level at this residence, that's where you and I are standing, we're standing at this residence in this uh, ag area, is 45 decibels. So just make that assumption. This is the spectrum of sound that that wind turbine makes. And notice a couple of things. First of all, the spectrum for the wind turbine sound which is mostly the sound from the blades passing through the air, is very similar to the natural windy noise background sound you would hear on a windy night. Secondly, notice that the, the wind turbine infrasound is no higher than the natural background. In fact, in this and several other instances, it's lower than the natural background sound. And finally, that both of them the wind turbine and the natural background infrasound are at least 30 decibels below the hearing threshold. And why is that important? Because no health effects have ever been demonstrated in any study for infrasound exposure below the hearing threshold. And both the wind turbine and natural background sound are at least 30 decibels below that hearing threshold. I like to use this in public hearings because I 
I say, oh, but by the way, this, this isn't unique. Here's, here's wind farm B. This is another wind farm in, in the Midwest. And I, I can pull out other examples, and I'm sure if you read the literature, you've seen uh, consultants have published similar graphs as these in the acoustic journals. That um, un unless you think Mother Nature is, is causing adverse health effects um, when, on, on a windy day, you can't tell me that, that this wind turbine is, is going to adversely affect my health because there's some hidden uh, impact, you know, that's wrapped up in this mysterious wind uh, infrasound that we can't hear. So those are just some facts regarding actual measurements at a wind farm uh, to show you the comparison between infrasound from a wind turbine and that of the natural background when we go out to take measurements. So on this topic, conclusions, the wind turbine infrasound is typically 30 decibels below the hearing threshold, below which no adverse health effects have been documented, and natural background levels of infrasound are often higher than those from the turbines themselves. I'm just moving along now to the second uh, issue, shadow flicker. What is flicker? It is the alternating changes of light intensity caused by the moving blade casting shadow on the ground or structures. Shadow flicker does not occur uh, unless the sun turbine and the viewer are lined up perfectly. It doesn't occur on cloudy days, when the wind is below the cut-in speed, or beyond 10 rotor diameters, approximately 1,000 meters because of, of the optics. Uh, this is a, a typical uh, shadow flicker graph that a consultant would produce for a wind farm showing the hours per year of a possible shadow flicker and the butterfly pattern is determined by the, the change of, of the sun through the sky over the seasons between sunset and sunrise here in the uh, northern hemisphere. Uh, some mention about uh, flicker possibly uh, adversely affecting uh, uh, epileptics, uh, that there's nothing to that. The American Epilepsy Society uh, Association, I should say, has said that three hertz is the safety threshold, and as long as any sort of light flickering effect is has a frequency below that, there is absolutely no risk to epileptics. Uh, it's really an annoyance only, not a health concern. We finally uh, we find it rarely regulated in wind farms that are operating today, though, though it's more often now that um, municipalities are asking for some type of limit. Typically in the industry we use 30 hours per year, which is a number that was established in a general court case. What are the options for the consultant and, and his client to try and get, get around uh, instances where the turbine is going to exceed 30 hours per year? Uh, perhaps revise the layout. There are fairly sophisticated curl curtailment programs uh, that the turbine manufacturers now offer uh, on their product based on time of day, wind, and, and solar insulation that can turn the turbine off for very short periods of time to uh, lessen shadow flicker also on a property by property basis vegetative screening. Here's an example of a successful uh, turbine layout on a project um, in, in the Midwest where, where every one of these turbines has been sited such that the houses, which are the black squares here, have below less than 30 hours per year of shadow flicker, which are the orange lines kind of uh, embedded in those butterflies you see around, around each turbine. Visual impacts is a, another topic that the consultant uh, uh, often has to con confront. The, um, tasks that, that one would do in performing a visual impact assessment would be, first of all, photo documentation of what the existing views look like from residences, uh, town centers, or state parks, and then doing a photo simulation such as this, showing you know, what it's going to look like after the turbines are built, and then finally, some type of subjective analysis, because this is obviously subjective, we're not me measuring uh, things like, like decibels um, and trying to make a determination whether this is a, an unreasonable uh, adverse effect on, on the views that, that people will have. I'll just run through a, a case study that we recently worked on. Um, a wind farm up in Prescow, Maine 
And this is a state that does have a visual impact assessment requirements for wind farms. The state had previously identified the scenic resources of significance, or SRS, and then the consultants produced a viewshed map uh, of the SRS and the number of turbines that would be visible at any point in the area around that project. And what that looks like is this map here. So there are 120 turbines in this project. Those are the black dots. So here are the black dots are the turbines. Uh, this is basically an uninhabited area. There's a few uh, homes and a few seasonal hunting camps, but there aren't too many people that live up in this area of Prescott, Maine. Uh, this outer perimeter, just to give you perspective, is eight miles from the center of the, of the wind project. Uh, this is a three-mile radius from any turbine. And um, as luck would have it for this developer, the only identified scenic resource in the vicinity of this project was a Roostick State Park. It's way up there at the top in the middle. It's that little tiny green uh, comma up there. And the colors on the map tell you how many wind turbines you can see uh, from any point on the land. So if you're standing here where it's purple, you can see 70 to 80 turbines. Uh, orange is like 30 to 40, and, and yellow gold is maybe 10 to 15 turbines. Uh, fortunately, you'll see that there's no color uh, overlapping a rustic park. So the, the applicant in this case could bring a map like this to um, the permitting agency, which was uh, the state DEP, and say, you know, we don't have to even make a subjective determination uh, because there are no turbines visible, thankfully, from the only uh, scenic resource that matters in this case. But in most cases, you, you do get into a bit of a discussion, let's say, in public hearings with people as to what's important in terms of a, in terms of a view shed. Well, as we've seen, that there is no foundation to the claims that um, low frequency or infrasound from turbines are greater than that from the background, natural background, or that they cause adverse health effects. But uh, we do know that about 4% of the population is very sensitive to sensory impact, input, and that, that means uh, sound, for example. And the swish swish character of the sound from a wind turbine uh, can and does annoy those types of sensitive people. So in the time that I have remaining here, what I'd like to do is just to summarize for you the findings from two well-respected expert review panels, which included medical professionals. And the first one is from the Massachusetts Department of Public Health's um, expert panel in 2012. Uh, Secondly, the available evidence shows that infrasound near wind turbines cannot impact the vestibular system. That means our balance system in our ears. Uh, third, this one you have, to, you have to listen carefully. There is insufficient evidence to determine whether there is an association between noise from wind turbines and annoyance. Okay, that's wind turbines and annoyance, which is independent of the effects of seeing the wind turbine. What that conclusion stems from are some recent research that's been done in our field about what are the triggers for annoyance. What really annoys people when they say, I don't, you know, I can't stand that wind turbine, you know, wind farm since it was built near my house. And <coughs> researchers have found that actually the strongest statistical association is really between uh, the presence of a wind turbine, the, the, the complaint, I should say, and, and the visual impact. So if somebody can see it, that's more important really to them than exactly what they hear. The second expert review panel I wanted just to summarize for you uh, was headed up by Dr. Robert McCunney, MD, and it was published uh, in the Journal of Occupational and Environmental Medicine just last year as a critical review of scientific literature on wind turbines and health. And their conclusions were as follows. Uh, first, no clear association between turbine noise and any reported disease or health indicator. Uh, secondly, self-reported annoyance correlates with the person's attitude towards turbines. 
the turbine's visibility and whether the individual benefits financially. Annoyance does not seem to correlate well with measured sound levels. And in fact, if we can rank those, uh, what the research uh, to date seems to show is that annoyance is correlated most important with just being able to see it. Secondly, whether, you, whether or not your neighbor is getting money and you're not getting money. <laughs> really, it's true. And thirdly, uh, attitude and the, the exact sound level seem to, seem to tie for third in terms of the statistical correlation of, of complaints. Uh, finally, uh, this expert review also found that infrasound does not, from turbines, does not uh, present health risks. So uh, that all sounds great, but what about all those studies you can read on the internet? You can go on the internet and you can find several studies, quote studies, that claim wind turbines cause some type of adverse health problems. And after having read dozens of these over the years, I've compiled this, this list of what I call the fatal flaws of anti-wind studies. Um, you hand me a study, I, I'm pretty sure I will have read it, and it will have one or more of these fatal flaws. The first is that they rely on what are called self-reported symptoms and claims of health problems. Self-selection bias is substantial. They're often anecdotal, and, and the only people that they they take data from are the ones who have complaints. Um, that's tied to the second problem, that is, there's no control group. Uh, if you've ever done um, a real research study, you know that to satisfy the basic requirements for a scientific study, it must have an adequate sample size and it must have control groups. None of the studies you will read about on, on the internet uh, satisfy that basic requirement. Third, there's no control in these, usually for confounding factors. That is, they don't account for the natural low frequency sound. They just pretend it isn't there. They take measurements in the field often and they say, oh, well that, that's so many decibels, that's the wind turbine sound. Well, wait a minute, what about all the background sound? Well, they never even talk about that. And finally, most of these studies do not account for what we call the nocebo effect. The nocebo effect is the inverse of the placebo effect everyone's familiar with, but the nocebo effect is that a worsening of mental or physical health is based on the fear or belief in adverse effects. So you can't, you can't touch what may harm you, but you, you believe something out there is going to harm you. You believe if you can see the wind turbine and you've read the article in the internet, you know it's going to harm you, and then in fact, you feel that harm. And when I first tell people that, they, they laugh, and, and I say, the nocebo effect is actually a very powerful effect in the human mind, because we, we're very susceptible to, to bad news suggestions. Um, let me bring this a little closer to home here in Nebraska. Uh, the uh, Cape Bridgewater Wind Farm in Australia, but, um, an acoustic study was done of that in the past year or so, and that was brought to the forefront in public hearings in Lancaster County before the Lancaster Planning Department and the Lancaster Board um, by a member of the working group. And uh, it was touted as showing there are adverse health effects from wind farms, and therefore we have to set a, a nighttime sound limit of 37 decibels in Lancaster County. And now you understand what 37 decibels means. It's a ban on wind, wind development. If that's what the county officials want, then let's be honest about it and then have them vote that directly. But that's not, that's not the way it's being portrayed. Well, what is this Cooper study all about? This study that says this, is, this proves this is the smoking gun for health effects. Let's go back through that, my favorite list of problems here. Uh, first, self-selection bias. There was a small group of six people who were selected, and they are all complainants, and they admitted beforehand having anti-wind attitudes. So, so that was the database. Uh, no control group was used in the Cooper study. Nothing was done to control for confounding variables, specifically the fact that the turbine operations move in parallel to wind speed and wind gusts. There was no control for the nocebo effect, which is based on the fear that something will bring you harm. Uh, interestingly, this quote study used a non-objective measure called sensations, 
uh, the participants were asked to keep a diary when they wrote down their sensations. So we, we didn't measure the sound level or the, or the noise inside their house or anything, but we asked them to keep a diary, I should say Mr. Cooper did. And what are sensations? Sensations were, do you feel a headache? Do you feel heaviness? Okay, is your heart racing? Okay, Those, these were the sensations. I read this and, and the first thing that came to mind was, oh my God, we've gone from science to seance. <laughs> in this. I mean, I, I kid you not, this is the basis of the widely touted Cooper study that uh, has been brought before public hearings in Lancaster County. And finally, the, the study was not peer-reviewed. It would be laughed out of a peer review, in my opinion. So, uh, how was this used? Um, <clears throat> the member of the working group brought this before the, the, the county board and said, Cooper found that these six subjects are able to sense the attributes of wind turbine emissions, whatever that is, emissions, without there being an audible or visual stimulus present. Bring on the, bring on the madam medium. Um, Cooper concludes, if you actually read the report in the executive summary, quote, for one resident, sensation, noise, and vibration were observed when the wind farm was shut down. Ah. <laughs> I can, it's, it's, it's in there. I had to read it three times to make sure it was there. Uh, so the participants were trying so hard to feel these sensations that they felt them even when the wind farm wasn't running. I mean, do you need to know anything else <coughs> to understand why this is not a credible study? But this is what's being, this is what we in the renewable in, uh, industry are facing, is people bring studies like this into public hearings and our, our, our elected officials, you know, they don't have the time to, to read these studies and find this and interpret it. And they're told this, this showed adverse health effects because somebody felt sen sensations. Uh, let me just conclude here with my recommendations for what I called a balanced approach. That is, let's make sure we build at least some wind development and we are a good neighbor to the people who live nearby. Uh, if there's no locally designed sound limit, I recommend 45 decibels for an internal self-imposed limit in, in the design. Uh, if the, the regulatory authorities desire something to control low frequency sound, I recommend you steer them to ANSI S12.9 part four um, as I've mentioned before, you, uh, wind farm will actually comply with that if you keep the broadband sound to about 45. Shadow flicker 30 hours per year, make sure you're using pitch regulated turbines. And I hope I didn't use up the whole hour and we have time for questions. I, that was about 45 minutes. Thank you very much. Is there any particular document where you could say, um, we looked at this, this is peer reviewed by this organization and you know all this stuff is kind of you know belonging. The question was is there is there some peer reviewed process that, that you all could reference when, when these studies or specific studies are brought to you? I, I, I don't know of a mechanism set up for that, but um, I would I would bring to the the attention of, of the regulatory board this this particular article is is a great it's a very long one. But it's, it's a great review article, and it's in the Journal of Occupational and, and Environmental Medicine in 2014. Um, the lead author is Robert McCunney, and it discusses the fact that, okay, we collected 300 studies on wind, tur wind turbine sound. All right, and first we, first we screened them to say, which of these pass any sort of minimal set of criteria for being a study? And then they whittled them down to maybe 100 studies. And then, you know, uh, which of these are peer reviewed? But, but they tried to summarize the results from the ones that weren't even peer reviewed, but they tried to put them all into perspective in terms of how much weight you give to the ones that are peer reviewed and the ones that are not. There, there are uh, many peer reviewed studies about annoyance in wind turbine, annoyance triggers in wind turbine sound. Uh, Aya Peterson of the uh, Sweden, uh, Swedish EPA has published a number of those. So if you read it in a journal, in a reputable journal, acoustics or medicine, it is peer reviewed because it wouldn't get into the journal without that.
Georgia House and Red Scan.